the fact that you had spent uh, uh, a decade working with uh, some of the greats in international arbitration, Rusty Park, uh, who used to be the chairman of the London Court of International Arbitration, and Karl Heinz Bockstiegel, who was also uh, the, um, uh, at the US Iran Claims Tribunal, as well as being an arbitrator yourself. Uh, as a way of introducing you with Simpson ADR and also mention what you've done recently working on increasing uh, arbitrators of African descent, uh, uh, knowledge and awareness of arbitrators of African descent. That kind of stuff is what I'd like to mention as, as, for, as part of introducing you bef uh, before we start talking. Is, is that kind of uh, an introduction okay for you? Uh, is there something else you'd like me to put in there? No, uh, that, that introduction sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then um, I, I really want to uh, hope that this can just be a conversation of this kind is that, you know, you had to confront being pushed from that offline kind of arbitration world into an online arbitration, at least for some parts of the arbitration. And so how, uh, did, you know, how did you prepare for that, that kind of question is where I'd go. So I'm gonna, and, and I, I'm thinking in terms of modules, one is like a little hearing, maybe 10, 15 minutes on your preparing, uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes say on doing the hearing and some of the things that surprised you. Uh, 15 minutes if it's, I don't know the numbers, but some, it's a module about mm -hmm. doing your award. And I don't know if you've done deliberations on a tribunal with others in an online environment. If you have, please speak to that. But if you're doing it as a sole arbitrator, just you're doing your award and how you got it notified out to the parties, um, at, uh, ultimately in, in the cases. And, uh, you know, then there's the, you know, in the hearing part, the one thing I want to talk about is what do you do when you don't have a party participating that that issue and, and and trying to address that kind of thing because it's sort of like the everything's fine with consent but what happens if you don't <laughs> yeah you know how, yeah. you know so it's I, I sort of seeing is get prepared uh, the arbitral procedure getting it going doing the award and notifying it you know things that the being on changed for you that's that kind of structure that I'm thinking of. Is that okay? Yeah, that's wonderful. And another point uh, that I was thinking about this morning was the fact that this was a midst of the pandemic arbitration. So yeah. when, when the party wasn't participating, there was really no way of actually knowing, is this person deliberately not participating or is this person sick? And what can the, what can I as arbitrator do to uh, preserve this person's rights just in case? Because yes. I mean, this was, uh, um, gosh, April and May. Yeah. And okay. if, I may, if, if I may make a comment, Ben, can yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, th it's simply to say basically that Muhammad Abdel Wahab, whom I'm sure you know, um, and myself have drafted a chapter which will be which will be published. But he also published his book now with um, Maxi Scherer and Niusha uh, Basiri about virtual hearings and about all these issues, which is uh, which are very interesting. And and the point that I wanted to make is that what I have said in the chapter we co-drafted is that where do the rights of the party refusing to to participate to a virtual hearing stop and where the rights of the other party wishing to go forward start first. Second, it also depends obviously on the law applicable to the procedure, on anything that may be contained in the arbitration clause that may prevent the arbitrator from going forward. In if if um, um, all the pathway as Mohammed called them and uh, that, that was published in, um, um, in Kluwer and on Gar, if everything has been verified by the arbitrator and if the arbitrator can really give a reason, uh, reason his decision, his or her decision about why this case should go forward, I think that the arbitrator is, uh, has the power to decide provided he protects, she protects the award 
and also any potential challenge. But I think that the, the arbitrator has the power, provided that the arbitrator has verified all the issues that may jeopardize the, um, the, the, the validity of the award. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that was how I looked at the. Um, that was how I looked at the rules as well. They didn't require that each party affirmatively consent to uh, an online hearing. Instead, the these rules uh, really they empowered. They required the arbitrator to inform the parties and to receive their views, and then based on these views to decide whether and how to conduct the hearing. It left a lot of. Okay. Uh, leeway uh, for the arbitrator. I forgot I need to close my office door. Okay, great. So, so uh, what I propose is that I'll, I'll start the, the formatting, the, the, the formal format here in modules at this point, since we've kind of done the warm ups, if I could call that, but we've just done. Okay. So uh, I'm going to now go into um, pres presenter role. So for Colin, please understand that this is where I'm imagining the recording should start in terms of when you slice and dice everything. You got it. I'm going to edit all this down. So I appreciate the, the markers, Ben. OK. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are really happy today to have with us uh, Catherine Simpson of Simpson ADR, who is going to talk to us from the point of view of an arbitrator in an online arbitration space. Now, Catherine Simpson has worked for, I believe, decades, if I remember right, with uh, the, some of the greatest arbitrators that were all well known, such as Rusty Park at London Court of International Arbitration, and we, uh, Karl Heinz Bockstiegel of Germany, um, who uh, was uh, at the Iran US Claims Tribunal. And she's also an arbitrator in her own right, uh, 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 dealing with cases. And so she has a vast experience. Another thing that a lot of people don't know about Catherine is that uh, she has been really an amazing. Uh, force here uh, in, the, in the United States for arbitrators of African descent in trying to uh, highlight the importance of naming and uh, appointing and hiring people of African descent in the international arbitration arena. So uh, she's a really good person too. And so I'm really happy that she's been willing to share some time with us today with regards to her experience as an arbitrator in online arbitration. So Catherine, welcome. We're really happy to have you here today. Thank you, Ben. It's, it's an honor to be here. Well, Catherine, to start off, um, one of the things uh, I was thinking about is how is uh, an arbitrator, how do you sort of prepare yourself for being in this online arbitration space as opposed to all those offline arbitrations that you you'd had before you know what were the kind of thoughts you had to think about or for just preparing for this new environment if i could say it like that well for preparing for the hearing i started to think about what makes what makes an in person hearing special and what is going to make an online hearing different one thing that makes an online hearing different is exactly this. We can focus in exactly on one another's faces, and that is something that you don't do in an in-person hearing. Instead, you'll be able to look back at all of the arbitrators, the counsel on each side, the witness in the middle, and there will be plenty of uh, events to distract your eyes. Uh, the online set, setup simply doesn't do that, but there, there are ways that um, I thought I needed to protect the award that would eventually come out of the hearing because I didn't want a party to be able to challenge the award based on saying, well, it didn't look like she was paying attention. Because like right now I'm looking directly at the camera and I'm giving you that, that warm and fuzzy feeling of eye contact. And in reality, it's not eye contact at all. If I were trying to look at you, I would be looking at this part of the screen. And so I wrote an introduction for the hearing that went through all of the different places that I would be looking, during, that I was planning on looking during the hearing so that the parties wouldn't be uh, scared or annoyed or think that I wasn't paying attention. 
So I said, you know, here we have eye contact, but claim it. Sometimes it's going to be far more comfortable for me to look at you directly when you're speaking. And the same is true for you, respondent. But in addition, I've got screens where I've got some evidence here and some evidence here. And even though it looks like I'm looking completely off camera, I'm, I'm not. I'm totally involved in the documents that you've submitted and that you've submitted and in what each of you are saying. But I also pointed out that they would see me doing a lot of this because I still like taking notes by hand. <laughs> sometimes I type notes, sometimes I take them by hand, but I take really good notes by hand. And I did, you know, what's, what's that thing going on at the bottom of the screen? But um, I got a little bit personal with the parties because um, it's, not, it's not totally visible right now, but it's starting. I have a little muscle on my forehead, and when it gets tired, I look skeptical. Everybody's resting face does something different, and my eyebrow raises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, is that once my eyebrow goes up, if it goes with the other one or just on its own, it doesn't always go down on its own, and I won't even feel it. So I let the parties know that if, if I was looking at them or the camera with a raised eyebrow, it was really, it didn't communicate a thing. Yes. I would just have to reach up and manually put that puppy down yes. and we would continue. And, and that gave the parties a laugh, at, fortunately. And, but they also thanked me because if, when they were speaking, if they had seen my eyebrow still in the upright position, it would have disturbed them. Yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, that whole dialogue there uh, seems to me like the, uh, the getting acquainted moment, if I can say that, where, where people really relax if you're, you're trying to get people to relax and also have your credibility raised with them as to your neutrality is is that part of that what you're thinking about you know well yes and it was also um it was making them comfortable and letting them know that if they had any um interesting facial or verbal tics that wasn't uh, this hearing was not going to be a contest of who could stare most intently directly into the camera, but that for me, it was more important for them to get the information out. Now, another thing that I did setting up for the hearing is I decided that I was not going to be sitting. I'm, actually, I'm standing up right now. You can see my uh, high back chair behind me because I know that when I'm sitting, I can start to slouch. Maybe I'll, uh, I might relax into something and really look like I'm not paying attention. But in an online hearing, if I'm standing up, my feet are going to tell me exactly when we need a break. So nobody's mm -hmm. going to have to run through four or five hours of nonstop online hearing. Oh, two hours? two and a half hours, we will be taking a break. Yeah. <laughs> it's a matter of physics. These are great tricks of the trade, I think, you know, really, really of figuring out how to manage the, the, inter the interaction, but it's at a distance, yet it, it, it's, uh, that's great. So, so if I could, if correct me if I could sum it up, you, you start off by getting everyone comfortable maybe even getting some reveals of people of their own tics, helping them understand your technology space. And I would assume could also let, let you know what is their technology space in terms of they might have four screens in front of them and they refer to this or that or something. Um, uh, one of the things that I was wondering about is this famous share screen technology here. Did you think about sharing screens or did parties as part of their exhibits to, they think about sharing screens with you to show what they were trying to talk about, like a PowerPoint, that kind of thing. Yeah. No, we, we didn't share screens. Okay. And I like the idea of sharing screens, except that I'm not ready to share mine. Yeah. Because 
<laughs> well, when you, when you share a screen and you have three monitors going, as I do, I don't, I don't want the parties to see exactly what I'm looking at. That could, right. that could unduly uh, prejudice one party, benefit another party. And in an in-person hearing, they would never get the opportunity to see what my desktop looked like. Why, why should that change in the online world? Right. So what the parties did was they sent to the, um, the arbitral institution that was hosting the hearing simultaneously their PowerPoints or PDFs uh, that they were going to be using. And this was planned into the procedural order ahead of time so that it wouldn't be that one, that one party got everything and the other was still preparing. Okay. Okay. All right. So now with regards to this, these bundles of documents that we imagine in the physical world. Okay. Now, uh, I guess uh, like a folder in uh, in Microsoft Word or something like that, Outlook folders. How well did the people? Uh, how 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 important is it for the person preparing something for you as the arbitrator to be clear in their organization in an online electronic format? of what they're trying to present in their case. I hope that this is the moment that hearing bundles might disappear. It is, ah. well, if in, in a proceeding, especially in a large proceeding where you've got thousands of exhibits, the exhibits are numbered consecutively. And this was also for my hearing something that we set out in procedural order one. And R1 is always going to be R1. R34 is going to be R34. And I noticed in the in-person setting, when parties would say, I would need, I need you to turn to uh, binder B tab 12. Could you look at that document and tell me what it is? And they would read the title. And then for me as tribunal secretary, I was always trying to figure out, okay, they're talking about R34 in binder B for this witness. Now, I hope that parties will be able to use, be straightforward with tribunal USBs uh, that only reference the exhibit number rather than an entire map to how you could maybe find it in the paper world. Right, but, right. Uh, but there are uh, online programs that do uh, virtual hearing bundles, uh, Casado being one mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with. And and uh, and that that I I imagine that clarity is as usual even more important maybe in the online space and then the offline space in the manner in which they present their case, right? Organization clarity, like a hyper level of organization, you would say, just to make it really simple for you for the arbitrator to understand where they're going well you know in the online setting you you don't have the dramatic page flipping or the reaching for the binder and really in an online setting people have different levels of patience mm -hmm. i think that people are much more uh, instant in demand right now when it's an online event than an in-person event where people it takes small breaks throughout. Okay. Okay. But, All right. Well, I thank you for that sort of uh, introduction to the preparation and sort of, I don't know, the philosophy of doing the online arbitration as the arbitrator. Now, I think go to a second uh, module, which is actually in the hearing. Um, and uh, so let's imagine that there's a hearing uh, and uh, somebody has, is a witness, right? And so assume they would be in a box somewhere on your screen as the witness. And there may or may not be the counsel for a direct examination or cross-examination who is speaking from their box to that other box. Um, are there things that made you nervous about or concerned about the witness really just being 
like they're sitting in a chair in front of you or people off screen who might be whispering things to them or their cell phone might be saying things. You know what I mean? This kind of stuff that you, you could see immediately if it was in a physical room, but it's very hard. Yeah. And that, that's a concern for people. You know, how do you know that a witness is really, really telling the truth? And I'm sort of in the camp of you don't. There's no, there's no, there's no magic that says that an arbitrator can look through their eyes and see deeply into a person's soul and determine if they are lying. But what an arbitrator can do is rationalize and think about how does this person's testimony really match up with the evidence that is in front of them. And I don't think that a witness's oral testimony should be discounted at all by virtue of the fact that they are testifying in a virtual setting. Uh, similarly, if somebody were only presenting a written submission, the concern that they were getting ideas from here and there or being told what to write, that would already exist in the paper document. So, you know, I'm not sure how much of a, a bigger or worse problem it is in the oral setting, but it, it makes it all the more important to be on top of the, the documents that have been submitted. Okay, okay. And that's where you have your other screens with all the documents there that you can go to. And if they're well organized by the, by the clients or by, by the, the parties, then you can go boom to 34 where that's the one he's talking or she's talking about and all that. Got it. And um, how about, let's talk about cross-examination, right? The, the wonderful cross-examination moment. How, uh, in your experience, was is that a different, say, online than offline uh, in terms of, I don't know, all those theatrics that you were describing a little bit earlier, you know, how do they play? How does a great theatrical courtroom player yeah. look to the arbitrator now that they're online? Once upon a time, there was a presidential debate in the United States. How did it look to audiences across the world when the two debating were interrupting each other? Mm. At the yes. end, I think, yeah, everyone was annoyed. Mm -hmm. And annoyed is, I think, the last, uh, the last thing that anyone wants their arbitrator to be. So we set out at the beginning that, uh, that it is important for whoever's speaking to actually be given the opportunity to finish their sentence or finish their thought. And that importantly, it's not cross-examination. For me, it's not a contest of who gets to say the most, the longest. What we're there for is the information. And I also promised that um, if I felt it was getting repetitive or um, if I had additional questions that I needed to raise, that I would raise those. Okay. But of course, giving the parties the, uh, the first opportunity to, uh, to address the witness and the witness's evidence. Okay, okay, I see. Um, and then um, another issue that I can see happening in the hearing is everybody's happy to show up and do the hearing and their witnesses and all that. And it's that sort of collegial or international arbitration experience. But what do you do if you have a, um, a party who does not show up, the, you know, especially in the time of this pandemic and all that, you know, all of a sudden a party disappears. Um, and then you want to move the arbitration forward at a reasonable pace and probably some pressure from the arbitral institution for you not to just take the pandemic off, so to speak. Um, so what, what about it? Uh, how, how do you deal with those kind of situations? Actually, the first thing that the parties that were participating and I did um, was we agreed in PO1 to waive certain time limits because it turned out this was the height of the pandemic that uh, the strict adherence to different time limits was not going to 
uh, was not necessarily going to facilitate the case or guarantee the party's due process because we really had no way of knowing is this a party that is deliberately not participating or is this a party who is caring for someone or um, is uh, him or herself sick? So um, first was making sure that the uh, party was actually informed of the proceedings and the institution took the lead on that um, through email, on paper, with different, um, different mailing services and the institution was convinced that uh, the party had received a notification. Uh, but in addition, I made it clear to the parties that you know this is an arbitration of all three of them, uh, one claimant, two respondents, and that things would be easier if the third would participate. And since they, coming out of a business relationship, had a better connection to him than, uh, than anybody else in the room, it could be helpful for them to write to him and make sure that they did their best to, uh, to bring him into the process. Now, he, uh, he unfortunately never joined, but fortunately, uh, the arbitration rules did not require his consent, his affirmative consent in order uh, for there to be an online hearing. I um, accepted the views of the participating parties and found that it was far more reasonable and feasible to have an online hearing, and uh, and that's how we that that's how we did that. But then, in in an in person hearing, when somebody doesn't show up, it's it's very easy. Everybody just stays in the hearing room. You you pull out your favorite book, kick up your feet, and wait wait out the the rental period. <laughs> give that person, right, give, give them exactly the opportunity to, to participate at the hearing if they want to. And uh, for this procedure, we had reserved several hours for the hearing, and we were actually done with um, the case presentation of the sides, particip the parties participating after about three and a half hours. So we left the meeting open for three and a half hours. Um, I read a book. Um, the, the other parties were, assured me that they were available within a shout. And also during that, when I had to take small breaks, I would let the parties know that we were having a five or 15 minute coffee break, put a sticky note up on my camera and uh, leave the room. And it worked. Unfortunately, he did not participate, but um, I was able to do exactly what an arbitrator would do in the in-person setting to ensure that somebody had every opportunity, every possible opportunity to participate. Yeah. So I see, I hear notice uh, an opportunity to be heard really being looked at and the flexibility that the arbitral rules provided allowed you uh, to 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 look at that now beyond the arbitral rules I I don't know where the place of arbitration was for this particular case but um, the law at the place of arbitration whether it is how we could call it online arbitration friendly or not you know not very um, it required, um, of course, the, the law of the seat was silent on uh, online proceedings, so they were not banned, but they required the arbitrator to sign an, an oath before a notary uh, promising to listen to all of the testimony and to give it all fair consideration prior to the start of any testimony. And that put me in a difficult position at the height of the pandemic to think about when and how, when will I ever be able to find a notary to, uh, to swear this to. And for, yeah, fortunately found found one in time, but it was, it was very stressful. I, I've never signed a document uh, under such stress. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And uh, so, and then uh, do you have to exhibit 
the document to the parties at the time uh, of the, the hearing or something? Is that part of what's required or just that that's done formally that you have that in your paper that you've got this notarized doc? Or is that given to the institution maybe? Maybe that uh, the arbitral institution? Um, if the institution had ever needed it, I would forward it on, but it was for my records. Okay. okay. To comply with those requirements. All right. Um, this is going to sound very mundane, and I apologize for it, but um, our There's no such thing as mundane. Okay. Uh, our, you know, arbitrators are uh, compensated and they have expenses. Um, arbitral institutions have administrative costs that are there. Uh, did you have to address that? Were people making their payments to, I don't know, the institution as opposed to to you or how did that whole side, I'm imagining an ad hoc arbitration situation where there isn't an institution and you know when you're virtual like that how does this all kind of work? Uh, it's probably just as simple as buying something on Amazon but I figured I'd ask you if, how does it work. Well I mean, for, for this institution everything related to that went through the institution so I, I didn't have to touch it at all but um, I've also done ad hoc cases and what what has been helpful for lots of tribunals is to hire uh, is or rather to outsource it to an arbitral institution to act as the funds holder and to do all of that management. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. Excellent. So, you've now heard from the parties. You've heard these incredible witnesses. And now I'm going to kind of segue to another uh, subject now, uh, which is that you're now deliberating and writing your award. Okay. How did the online space change any of that uh, with regards to how you went about, it, as opposed to those offline binder kind of situations that you? dealt with before? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it was, it was different in the sense that um, I was a sole arbitrator and that it was you know, my award. But um, I informed the parties that I might request a uh, post hearing brief, a short uh, question and answer from them. Uh, but as I was, I was as I was going through everything, it, I really had everything that I needed. All of the gaps had been filled uh, in the hearing. And there's a practice. I think it comes out of the ICC, where, uh, or I think it's the ICC who um, did this study, that arbitrators who go to the hearing with a working paper already prepared, and then who stay after. Um, maybe a day, up to a day, to deliberate with their colleagues, they prepare awards faster than everybody else. So I went into this hearing with a working paper that set out all of the, uh, all of the mundane points and uh, had the summaries of their, their arguments and space for the questions that I had or the gaps that I saw were there. Okay, okay. And then, uh, then after you finish this award, and we always imagine this award, or maybe I'm just too, too old school, but we imagine the award is this 40 page, 30 page document, it's got a signature, excuse me, it's got a signature made at some place in the world, place of arbitration. Um, how did, did that award, and was it an electronic signature or a PDF, how, how, how did the award get communicated to the parties or notified to the parties? In what format was it done? Those kind of things. I believe it was notified to the parties as a PDF document through the institution, but I did send the institution several signed copies. Uh, they were not notarized copies, thank goodness. But, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but the institution yeah. has the original signed one, several ones, that's there, uh, that uh, we come back to the, uh, I don't know, the physical or, or offline world at the end with that hand signature there with the date and, the, and made at and all that stuff. 
Well, it's, uh, that's really, really interesting, I think. And um, I, I wondered, maybe sort of as a last question here, for people who are going into this area, and I, I, maybe going from domestic arbitration to international and are seeing their life all of a sudden thrown up in the air from being sort of their greatness offline, now going into online. Um, do you have any sort of, I don't know, words of wisdom or words that you would try to say to those people as they make this transition? It's not a very big transition. Most deliberations have been done online for years. Um, tribunals emailing one another, sending drafts back and forth. That hasn't changed. And most tribunals, well, most lawyers are still very far away from their arbitrators, and most things are still happening over email. You know, as for online hearings, I mean, I, I think I've gotten okay at looking straight at the camera. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't. I'm looking at you, you know, and I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's hard to do, but to remember that the point of a hearing is not to see who can, who can have the most uh, poise and look uh, the most confident. The point of the hearing is to make the transcript that will help in the preparation of the award. And we still get those hearings. We still get those transcript, those important transcripts out of online hearings. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Catherine, for spending some time with us today and walking us through these uh, aspects of this kind of new, new world that is kind of like the old world, but it's the new, new thing. And, uh, and really sharing your experience with us. I greatly appreciate it. And we want to wish you all the best. Can I ask thank you. a question, Ben? Oh, yes. Now we can go to questions, yes. <laughs> First, thank you so much, Catherine. That was extremely interesting. I love the, the comments and the tips and the recommendations you gave. And I'm happy to hear that the transition was very easy because this is exactly what we also think. And um, thank you also for the tip about standing up. This is a very interesting <laughs> tip. I think no one thought about it. Uh, that I will note that down. I was curious to note about the case in which you had to provide a notary, uh, an official document from a notary. Is, was that request in the case um, with the applicable law or is it simply because the hearing was going virtual that one party felt more comfortable to ask you for such a document? Oh, it was it was contained in the state arbitration act. Okay, so that as, as a requirement, right? So it wasn't a requirement particularly related to the online hearing. Right. It it was a requirement related to any kind of hearing. What made it awkward was that um, the entire state was on lockdown, and I had, to, <laughs> yeah, I had to find a a, um, a notary and try a socially distanced um, signature. But I needed that in order to protect the award that would come out of the proceedings. Definitely. And were the parties afterwards, um, did they feel comfortable and did they take the procedure forward without raising any objection or any issue? Yes, they, um, they were comfortable and we completed uh, the entire case. Very interesting. This is the first time I hear that. Well, thank you so oh, much. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I think uh, unless Colin has any questions, I think that... Uh, no, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Catherine. This was incredibly valuable. <clears throat> so I'm going to edit down this video into a couple chunks, and then I'll share it with everyone, and then we can review it together. But I thought this was really, really fantastic. So I really appreciate you taking the time, Catherine. Yeah. Thank yeah, you Catherine. for having me. This was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And you're the first, the first one we've done. So, yeah, so you're setting the template for future, the future ones as well, you, Catherine. You, 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 set a you high put bar. up a high bar, sister. You put up yeah. a high bar. Well, and, and yes, Mirez, I, I'm, I'm still standing. That's why uh, when I had to run to open the door, 
I, I didn't get out of a chair. Yes, <laughs> I, I noticed that. I noticed that. <laughs> well, what do they say? Sitting is the new smoking, so it's good. You you don't smoke, so. Right there we go. I'm, we're we're all gonna come out of this uh, far more healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have this healthy fat here. It's really helped. <laughs> <laughs> I joke. Okay, sorry. Okay. All, All right. right. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I, we appreciate it, Catherine. And uh, Ben and Merez, uh, I'll be in touch soon once I get the edits completed. But um, uh, All right, brother. this was wonderful. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Everyone stay safe. Okay. Okay. Stay safe. We'll all talk soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.